ministry. She thank you for joining us. Thank you very much. Well, I guess uh, congratulations to being in order on the commissioning of the Lagos Ibadan uh, Rail Line last week by uh, President Muhammadu Buhari. But at the moment, that Lagos Ibadan Rail Line, the service that is provided, uh, is really still skeletal. Uh, when would the rail line be completed and it will become fully operational? And what are the plans in place for the proposed, the planned extension of that rail line from Ibadan to Oshogbo, to Ilorin, to Mena, to Abuja, all the way to uh, Kano? Well, uh, Ruben, coming from you, I should be, I should be appreciative of your, your congratulations, your message to other Nigerians. <laughs> But, but then what, what to say to you is that the rail line has been completed. There's nothing, there's nothing that indicates that it has not been completed. Why the services are still skeletal is because there's what they call communication and signaling. Now, it takes six months to know that that equipment is, is, is in perfect condition. You continue to test the equipment so that you don't have any uh, train accident. So we are moving from two... Uh, services in a day to four. It will be a gradual progression. Uh, I believe that by the end of the year, we'll be doing 16 trips a day, which will be, which will be phenomenal. Yeah, but I asked about a plan for extension all the way to Kano. Again, I'm happy, I'm happy you're asking that question. I thought we were being criticized for taking the loans. Now everybody's asking when I bring the rail to my village, not even to the city. Uh, uh, as soon as we get the Chinese loan, we will commence the construction of a badon to Abuja. But uh, by, by, before the end of this month, we should commence the construction of the Kano Kaduna Rail. We've already mobilized the contractors with some funds. Uh, we will fund it initially from our budget, pending when the, the, the loan facility or the negotiation for the loan facility has been completed. Well, speaking of loans, what exactly is your source of funding for the project and who are the contractors working on it? <laughs> a good question. <laughs> Even when uh, Ruben Abati was speaking, he did say the loan was, was from the China. I mean, the project was funded from the Chinese loan. And like you know, we're waiting for further negotiation to conclude, to conclude the negotiation of the Ibadan to Kano. Uh, because we don't have time, uh, COVID or no COVID, we will commence construction with the uh, money funded from the budget between Kano and Kaduna, when the loan negotiation has been completed, we will commence the Ibadan to Abuja. We believe that we should be able to complete the Kano Kaduna one before the end of the government, while the one from Ibadan to Abuja may be completed just some few months after we leave office. But before we leave office, we should have been able to take it to about 80 percent uh, completion. Okay, uh, two things. Number one will be Can you just let to Abuja the stops, the areas, you know, the knock on effect on the economy? And secondly, uh, when people do infrastructure like rail, it normally should pay back over a period of time. When is that payment, well, that payback going to start? When are we going to start making, you know, some money at least to service our debt from rail? Is there anything on ground for payback? And let me go to your Kaduna line. A lot of people are complaining, uh, Kaduna to Abuja, that the cost was increased to 3000 because of COVID and social distancing. Now that there's no more social distancing, a lot of people are back on the trains full time. The cost is still 3000 You're asking, is that things, when things go up in this country, don't come down at all? At all, it, it, it shouldn't come down. Why should things go up and come down? If you, if you say so. Several interview, interviews have attended that the Badan one will go from Ibadan to Oshubu, which is the capital of uh, Oshun State. From Oshubu, we will go to Ilorin, Ilorin uh, to Mina, Mina, to Abuja. These are state capitals, but it will, it will pass uh, other communities like uh, the Jeddah and other areas, and then you get to Mina, and then from Mina to Abuja. Then the Abuja one to Kaduna is already constructed, and then it will go from Kaduna to Kano. That's that. 
Uh, you're looking at where economic viability. Uh, Ruben, I'm not aware of anywhere in the world, please help furnish me with information, where rail lines have been used to pay back such loans. No, anywhere in the world, anywhere. Uh, it's not, if you leave the rail as it is, it's not economically viable in terms of uh, cash. What makes the economic viability is the fact that economic activities like, for instance, if, if, you, are, if, you, if you manufacture in areas where the rail will pass through, then you can be sure that they would, they, the rail will provide you transportation and logistics. Now, because of the capacity of the rail to provide logistics and transportation, it impacts heavily on the economy and then reduces cost of transportation, improve, increase, increase employment, and improves on economic activities. That's, that's what you, will happen. But currently, I'd I like, I like to share with you the information that, as we're talking today, we've moved from the 70 million uh, revenue that accrues from uh, Abuja to Kaduna to 350 million as at last month, which means once we remove the operational costs, we have started paying back the loan even though that would, be, that would not be the only source of repayment. Well, Honorable Minister, uh, well, China, under its uh, Belt and Road Initiative, has been giving a lot of loans to uh, developing countries, either in Asia or Africa. But there is also this concern about how Chinese loans can be very tricky. Uh, what kind of loan security do we have in place in Nigeria to prevent Nigeria from getting into the Zambian situation? When Zambia ran out of uh, options for servicing its loans, China has practically taken over the national assets of, uh, of uh, Zambia, uh, including the national electricity company, Zesco. How do we prevent that from happening here in Nigeria? What plans do we have in terms of security? Ruben, I'm not aware of your information. What I'm aware of is the fact that when you take the loan, uh, you expect to pay back. And as we are talking today, we are paying back. Ruben, under the regime of President Goodluck Jonathan, you, the, the loan for uh, Abuja Kaduna was taking about $500 million. Ruben, as we are talking today, we've paid over $150 million on that loan. And uh, Nigeria has never defaulted when it comes to loan, uh, loan repayment. I don't also expect that we should we would default in any other uh, loans that we have taken. The loan for Kano, for Ibadan to Kano is about $1.5 billion. The rest, $500 million, came from our budget. I expect that whatever, budget, whatever loan we take, we'll be able to repay. I'm not aware that there's any clause in the, in, in the loan agreement that hands over any of our national assets to China. Yes, when you default, they may go to court. It depends on the outcome of the court case. So I'm not aware that there's anyone, any of the clauses signed by this government or, in, or, or the previous government of President Lord that uh, uh, mortgaged any of our national assets. Well, now let's move to maritime security and the Deep Blue Project. We watched a brief um, video on that before we started this conversation on the collaboration between Nigeria and Ghana, which underlines the importance of security of our coastal area. So can you talk about the Deep Blue Project and what exactly it serves to give to Nigeria in terms of maritime security? Now, if you observe before we came, a lot of uh, contractors were contracted to provide security for oil, oil companies in the water. <coughs> in fact, there was a case between us and OMSL in which OMSL provides about two or three or four boats to the Navy, and they collect 2,500 per vessel for the first day and 1,500 for the second day for about 30 days. In a year, like, like 2020, they made about $67 million. And it, when, such, when you hand over the security of the country to private individuals, it becomes very... It becomes very the responsibility of uh, OMSL and other security, so-called training. So the president kindly approved that the police, the army, the air force should be involved in providing security with those equipments that we have 
provided. So what the Deep Blue project does for you is that with, you have about three helicopters, two uh, fixed wings plane, you have about uh, 17 to 18 uh, boats, then you have about two vessels, uh, you have drones. What it does is that it gives you information where these criminals are, those who go and uh, destroy the pipes just because they are looking for oil to bunker. It provides you those, those information and you then deter them or you arrest them. That's what, that's what it does for you. So we're able, we're able to provide security in the coastal region, both on land and in this, on the sea. Now, those who provide the coastal security on land will be the Nigerian, Nigerian army and the police. And we've provided them with all the necessary tools that they need. We have ammunition, we have vehicles like APCs and all that for patrol by the coast. All that we believe will begin to yield fruit before, between now and, and, and next year. Uh, Minister, please tell me what's the cost on the rolling stocks of this train? I'd like to know about that because you keep talking about bringing rolling stock in. What, what's, what's this cost adding to us? How can we get to a level where we can start to you know, do at least some of the refurbishment of some of this rolling stock here, or even production. I mean, if the industries were working, if Ajakuta and the likes were working, we should be able to do rolling stocks in this country. So what's, what's the cost of that, and when are we going to get to that stage where we start to probably assemble these rolling stocks here? Well, we, we've already established a factory. Well, no, we're establishing a factory at uh, Kajola, Kajola with the Chinese, in partnership with the Chinese, where we begin to produce coaches, locomotives, and uh, wagons. Currently, they are assembling wagons. They will begin to assemble wagons there by the end of this year. Now, wh what did we do? We ensured that uh, out of the uh, wagons we are, we are supposed to buy from China, we asked them to bring in only 15% and assemble the rest here in Nigeria. After five years, they will move from assemblage to manufacturing or fabrication of those, of those wagons here. We also believe that, uh, in that in that five years, they should begin to assemble coaches, if possible, locomotives too. But it's difficult to, it's, it's difficult to actually manufacture locomotives where you don't have the necessary tools. But at least we'll start at the assembling the coaches. You see, you see, the question you ask is as if we, just, we, we should have been doing that by now. But we didn't just wake up by now. This is the first time that the government is beginning to focus attention on railway. And it just can't start three years ago. Suddenly, we are beginning to produce or manufacture uh, locomotives and, co and coaches. It will take time. We've sent children, some of our children to um, China to study the Chinese technology on railways. We are, we are establishing a transportation university in, in Daura, which will be managed by the Chinese in fi for five years. And, and train our, our young men and women. By the time they finish all this training and, it, and it, there is a transfer of technology, we should be able to begin to even lay our own tracks to ensure that we don't continue to import that, that technology. We then transfer technology to ourselves and ensure that we, we learn how to do it ourselves, including the production of the rolling stock. How much is the current rolling stock for Lagos? About $500 million. And most of them have come in, apart from the uh, the 85% the of the locomotives that we, we are asking them to assemble here. And that will be done before the end of the year. But the rest, coach, the rest uh, coaches, locomotives have arrived. They are at Papalanto. Well, um, we've been talking about Lagos, Ibadan, all the way to Kano, Abuja, Kaduna. Uh, is it possible for, us, for you to give us a picture of the rail line projects in the south-south and the southeast? I know there is a to worry, even if uh, recently some uh, uh, funny characters went and removed the rail bars. And uh, I, I guess that's also something you, you, you like to talk about. You know, you construct these rail lines, but they go and remove them. But first, the uh, uh, plan for the south-south and the southeast, and how the, that part of the country will be linked. And what you are doing about the security of those uh, uh, rail bars that people have been stealing. Oh. Okay, first is uh, the Portacot Medigree will start. We are trying to start Portacot Medigree this June. What is holding us from starting Portacot Medigree this June? What may be holding us from starting Portacot Medigree this June is the approval of a consulting engineer. We are waiting for BPP to conclude their studies. If they give us approval, then we'll go to cabinet. The 
moment cabinet is supervising engineers, which is the consulting engineers, then we will go to site. Because already we've also mobilized the contractors from our budget. That depending when they lose the contractors from a uh, budget, they should be able to start from Potako to Aba. We believe that when, they, when, when we start before the end of this year, we should be able to get Aba in terms of real con uh, lane of real tracks. I don't know about the, the terminals yet and the, and the signal, but I'm sure we'll get to, we'll get to Aba by the end of this year with the real tracks, if not, to, if not to up to my hair. Uh, so, like, I, but the protocol may degree will start this year, this June. Uh, I also expect that Kando Maradi will start this June. This June, at least in July. Uh, what I'll be waiting for, for funding, will be Ibadan to Abuja. But the, the rest of them will start this June. Yeah, I talked about the security of those rail lines. Now that we've seen reports of people oh, cutting off. Okay. Cutting okay. off the... Uh, okay. Yes. Please go ahead. I'm impressed by the fact, I'm impressed by the fact that the cutting off, the, this did not take place in the south side. It took place in Kogi. <laughs> it took place in Kogi. What they cut off was a, side, a siding. It's not a bar. It is actually a track. And if, imagine if, if any, any train was going to the siding. It would have uh, derailed. And once it derails, people would likely die. I have always accepted or supported those who said they should be, anybody who is found destroying any of those real assets should be tried for manslaughter. The reason is that if you cut off the, if you cut off the rail track, it takes about 800 meters for the rail driver to stop a train. So when, if he suddenly sees that there is no track at any particular place, even if he applies his brake, it will have crossed the track and it will derail. If it derails, people will die. So anybody caught doing that, if you ask me, the law should be amended to include the fact that he'll be punished for, for manslaughter if found culpable by the, by the court. That would be my recommendation. Then what are we doing? We have the Nigerian uh, Railway Police that is uh, going and inspecting from time to time. The next thing we also do is that before we run in a day, we get workers who live in different segments of the rail to inspect and ensure that everything is okay. Where things are not okay, they, they will uh, alert the management who will look at how to fix whatever that's gone wrong. That's how we discovered all those, uh, the worry one, because if we didn't do that, the rail will possibly, the train would have possibly gone there and would possibly have derailed. So we think that long-term measure will be to pass a law that punishes those who engage in that act with a, 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 a Listen of manslaughter. While, while we also think that uh, the police would up their game in, in, in trace, tracking and tracing these criminals so that you deter them from participating in, the, in such crime. And that thing would be um, information management and sharing, letting, uh, creating awareness for them to know the danger of such activity. And then finally, the police must first and foremost punish those who buy these tracks because if there is no market then there will be no if there is no demand then there will be no supply well i would say that it's manslaughter because if you cause an unlawful death of a human being whether or not you plan to you ought to be punished you ought to have the full weight of the law thrown at you but i want to talk about speaking of unlawful deaths the burning issue facing nigeria today which is insecurity we often don't think of the Ministry for Transport when we're talking about insecurity. We think of service chiefs and the police force and what have you. But I want to specifically tie your projects, rail infrastructure, Deep Blue Project, how does it impact that fight against insecurity in Nigeria? Because most of us Nigerians are not seafarers. I want you to explain exactly how it impacts all of us, how it benefits all of us. Okay, so the first, the first thing is that we are in charge of the security of the water. That's why we're providing the deep blue project. We're not in charge of the security of the whole nation. What we are in charge of is the security of the water. So we provided the deep blue project to protect people who engage in water activities. 
Now, uh, uh, Nigerians make money from every sort, every, everything, whether good or bad. Most Nigerians, uh, when I say Nigerians, I mean all Nigerians, most Nigerians, especially Nigerian elites. So they were making money from insecurity. In fact, some of them were actually causing the insecurity so that they can make more money. Especially when it comes to the, oil, the money they make from the oil companies in the so-called provision of uh, uh, security architecture for them. Now, what, 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 we, what, we've, what we've done with Deeply Project is that we will reduce the cost of producing oil in Nigeria. Because in producing oil, they're also building the cost of security. So by the time we provide the security in the water, the economy will improve because there will be more money coming into the economy. That, that's the impact it will have when it comes to the Deep Blue project. In fact, the Israelis who did that, that, tra that training said, in six months to one year, if there is no improvement in the economy in terms of how much comes in, both to Nimasa, MPA, and, and, and the oil, oil industry, then you could come back to us and we'll be willing to refund. But you know, it's simple mathematics. It is true that the moment you can take away these criminals from the water, the moment you can take away these contractors from the water, then the cost of uh, security, which is borne either by an NPC or by the air companies, will be part of what will come back to us as income. Then on land, all our, real, all our coaches, in all, you have armed policemen in all our coaches, and you have enough in any, any trip we are making to, that, to withstand any attack from anybody. That's why all those lies, oh, that uh, Kajuna train has been attacked, all oh, lies, none. It can't happen. Why can't it happen? Because we have enough security. That's why it can't happen. The same with um, uh, Itabe Wari. You have enough security in those trains, not just not one policeman, enough to, to, to repel any, any attack. The same will happen when we start running uh, Lagos Ibadan. As, as we are currently running two trips, which by yesterday should have, been, should have started with four trips, you will have enough security inside those trains to withstand any criminal act. act. That, that's one assurance we give to Nigerians. Beyond that, I have no role to play with security. Okay, great, great, great uh, insight you're giving. But I have always made a case, and the last time you were here, you're here, I made a case for those narrow. Gauge lines. I mean, some of them were built in 1906, uh, the early days of the British. We used them up to the 70s. This, because this, this rail lines you're building, you're, the government is building, they're building standard gauge, but is it that we're going to abandon those narrow gauge lines? And I'll give you an instance. Take, for instance, the drudgery that it takes you if I'm going from Lagos to Ibadan and I have to go and stop in Omi. When I have a national rail station, the standard gauge line in Dubé, that is just inside of the town. So is it that we're going to abandon those narrow gauge lines? Are we not going to think of funding for it? That's one. Number two, uh, why is it that the Maradi line, you know, the funding scheme is different? It's not the Chinese that's doing that project. And what kind of rail is it going to be? I mean, I'm hearing stories that it's going to be all powered. There's going to be some form of electric, too. I mean, just expatiate on all of this. And why is it that it's a Portuguese company that is doing that, the funding channel is different from the Chinese loan you've been taking for all of this. China. The, the loan for Potakot Meduguri is not from China. We're negotiating with a, a European bank. The same thing as Kando Maradi, which is also an European bank that may give us The, the low most. It's, not, there's, it's going to be a diesel powered engine. There is nothing like an electric powered engine for us in Nigeria yet until we have sufficient, sufficient supply of power. You can't think, or when you don't have enough. Uh, um, Ruben, you know that by the time we took over government, power was at uh, 2,000 megawatts, 2,000 plus megawatts, so nearly 3,000. Even, even though we have increased it in this, in this government, I don't think we have increased it sufficiently enough to provide for real, real uh, uh, electricity powered rail services. That won't happen for now until we have sufficient power supply. So what, what we are currently uh, utilizing is the diesel powered uh, uh, locomotives. So you have the locomotives from, uh, uh, take the one we use, we use on the day of launching. In fact, I saw somebody write up that, oh, they are refurbished. Really. That, you see, the aerodynamics of 
uh, locomotives changes according to the length of the track. If it's intracity, intracity uh, track, you can use those ones that look very beautiful and all that. But when it comes to interstate transportation, just use, and they are, never, they are not refurbished. They are, they are brand new ones. I went on inspection myself and the Minister for Finance in, to, China to inspect the construction, and we saw the, the production of those, those uh, locomotives and coaches. So there is nothing different about, about, about Kano Maradi. It is simply just the same as Lagos Ibadan. The only difference between Kano Maradi and Lagos Ibadan is that the funding for Kano Maradi is coming from a European bank, while that of Lagos Ibadan came from the Chinese bank. Okay, the second question I ask you, what about those narrow, narrow gauge lines? What are we doing to them? Are we going oh, to yeah, forget yeah. them? Sorry, in, uh, sorry. You know, you know, you know. Old age has. I'm no longer as young as I used to be, Ruben. <laughs> so, now, but when it comes to <laughs> when it comes to the narrow gauge, uh, we we the contract for Potakot Meduguri is dual. What we are going to start this June is the total. Record. Construction of the one. It means that even where in the past the narrow gauge had avoided uh, either a hill or a valley or the line straight to reduce the length of the, the track and make it faster for us to back up the degree. At the same time, the president has directed that contract be awarded for standard gauge, which will be funded. When maybe when the next government comes. But the difference between the narrow gauge and the standard gauge is, is the speed, just the speed. Mm. Uh, the Lagos Kano narrow gauge is the one we are negotiating with different uh, interest groups that want to rehab rehabilitate those ones. That, because the first people we had that negotiation with was the GE. But you know what happened to GE? Now we are talking with different groups now, not just one. We have about three groups that we're talking with. Once we conclude, we'll go back to the president and to cabinet for approval. So you but still the one have, I'm sure of is the Port standard Akotidu, gauge which that is, goes which from Lagos to Ibado to Abuja, then you will have the narrow to, gauge, if people Kano. can bring money in, that still goes you know, through Lagos to Ibado, yes. through Dubai yes. and to Abuja uh, and uh, upwards. I'm not sure the narrow gauge yes. got up to Abuja. Yes. Yes. Okay, quickly, uh, Honorable Minister. I no, 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 no. It, 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 got, to, it got to Mina, Mina to Kaduna. Okay. Kaduna to Kano. Just, um... Okay, I want to ask you questions about her papa pot. Uh, it's just a pack of questions. If we could just take all of them together. The first is, when the president uh, visited last week and he was going to commission uh, a project at the port, all those trailers on the uh, way to uh, a papa pot suddenly disappeared. The road was free. Uh, was it a good idea uh, to hide the trailers to drive them off the road instead of allowing the president to see the reality, the frustration that people and businesses go through in Apapa? Two, the uh, rail line, Lagos Ibadan rail line, you talked the other time you were on this program about an extension to the ports, uh, to the Apapa port in particular. What is the guarantee that that will help the problem of congestion? in that port, considering the fact that there are other issues, turnaround time, uh, bureaucratic red tape, and all kinds of uh, issues that have made it difficult for every measure not to have worked in that place, including the to-call system. And then finally, still on the ports in Lagos, uh, the suspension of Addis Abala Usman. Many commentators said, you are the person behind it. When is she going to come back from suspension? What is the status? of the investigative uh, uh, panel uh, that you reportedly set up? I, I'm, not I'm not hearing Ruben again. Ruben, I'm not hearing you. No. I, Have you finished? I talked about the Apapa ports. The last point I brought up was Adiza Bala Usman and the investigation that's supposed that. to be going on and when she'll come back, yes. So I'm done on the Apapa ports. I, I, I'm not aware. I'm, uh, I'm not aware. I'm not aware that I suspended Hadiza. I'm not the president. I don't have such powers. That power rests with the president. 
And I'm not aware that Hadiza is actually suspended. What, what happened, I suspect, uh, don't forget I said uh, I was, it was, she wasn't suspended, is she was asked to step aside to enable investigation to be carried out on MPA, not on her, we're investigating MPA. Uh, at the conclusion of uh, the investigation, all the reports will be forwarded to the president who, who make a determination on the way forward. That's what will happen. When will the panel finish? I'm not aware. I don't know. The panel is now headed by between Minister of Transport and the Office of the Head of Service. The Office of the Head of Service contributed six persons, six persons, including auditors and accountants, and then the Minister of Transport just brought five. So it's a panel of 11 that has been instituted to investigate activities of MPA from 2016 to the present day. Um, apart from that, there's no other thing happening. There's, not, there's, uh, well, this, this, there's too much noise, just too much noise, especially your, this day, your, your second, your, uh, this thing, that is talking about uh, Hadiza MP. What is the special interest? That, that, that I, I want to know. But again, I'm not going to address it. That is, well, it doesn't become subjudice, even though it's not in court, but there's a panel. You don't have to influence the panel. Don't have, I don't have an opinion uh, over that. And I've told you here that uh, it, is, it is MPA that is under investigation. And the managing director of MPA has just been told to step aside pending when the investigation will be concluded. And when the investigation is concluded, the president will make a determination uh, or determine what happens next. The question, the other question was, I agree with you. That, you see, I was laughing when you were asking the question, why, how did those uh, trucks disappear? I asked the same question. I was in a bus, and I was in the train when I saw it. Everything had disappeared. Even inside the port that looks like a, that looks like a marketplace, like Osho, the market, was very well organized. No human beings were found loitering about. No trucks on it. And I, I, say, I just said, whoever did this, then we may need to... You see, you see, you know, what it shows here, the problem of uh, the seaport is the problem of efficiency. If, not, if, we, if they had the capacity in one day, not even one day, one night, because I was there the previous evening, and when I came back in the morning, everything had disappeared. If that can happen in one night, it means that the problem is management. No, no other thing. Uh, and, and I agree with you that do we need to wait for the president to come before we can, we can, before we can be efficient? That's the basic question to answer. And what I, have, what I did, uh, which will dovetail to that, that, that question you asked, what I did was to have a meeting with the terminal operators. And what, what I told them on Friday when I met with them is that they have to contribute to the reconstruction of the Papa Seaport. We must rebuild the Papa Seaport, take into cognizance all the issues that are, we are seeing now that frustrating the seaport. All those, where, where do you park the trucks? How many trucks can come, into, can come into the seaport at what point in time? How can a human being who has no business into the seaport, in the seaport come to the seaport? What is he doing at the seaport? The seaport is a security area. And it's not, if, even me, if I become a former minister, I'm not entitled to go into the seaport unless I have business in the seaport. Now, we're going to partner with uh, customs because they are largely, uh, they are, between them and MPA, they're the operators of the seaport and see how to arrest this situation. I believe that the, when we begin to uh, freight cargoes from the seaport through the rail, then we will reduce some of the challenges that we have at the seaport. That's, that's my belief. What is your response to critics who say that the Ministry of Transportation is not adhering to the plan, which states that no country in the world is currently building narrow gauge lines anymore, that they are archaic. Standard gauge, as you said, is faster, it's cheaper, more reliable, less accidents. You can get the spare parts, Port Harcourt, Maiduguri, narrow gauge line. As a journalist, please, Pierre. Out of their 3,500, uh, 30,500 narrow gauge, I mean, rail line, 30,000 is, is narrow. Narrow gauge. They all operate narrow gauge line. But, but see, when, you, when this information is carried out like this, you incite the southeast and the south, incite the south south. But it's not correct, completely not correct. And it's abnormal. to pass that kind of information is just going to Google and say, how many countries do you have in the world? And if they're not up to nearly 20 to 30 countries, call me back. 
I asked for your response to critics. I did not pass anything as a fact. And you've given your response okay. to your critics. So what, okay, okay, so, okay. Then, then tell the critics to do more studies. No, just you, you've just do done that. Studies. It's important right. that they, Mr. that. Mr. Amechi, real quickly. Uh, I want to know in total, uh, what's the kilometer of all these rail lines all over the country that you're doing? And how much was spent per kilometer? I mean, what's, what does the cost come down to per kilometer? And speaking of the South, South and South East, uh, would you, you know, fly a presidential flag maybe as a South, South candidate or a South East candidate? So this question never goes. I thought, I thought we are here to talk about transport, not about the uh, presidential election that will take place in 2023. And I've said this several times to as many persons as possible. Let me do my work. Ruben, allow me to do my work. I have not been sacked by the president, neither have I resigned, nor has our tenure come to an end. I'm currently the Minister for Transportation, and I'll continue to discharge that responsibility until such a time that I'm unable to discharge such responsibility again. Please, I don't want to be distracted. That would be the answer to the question. And uh, uh, Total what was that? across the country? And how much did the cost come down to per kilometer of track you did? Uh, Rufa, I won't be able to know that without the necessary documents. It will require. Uh, it will require my my looking at those papers. Until I do that, I may not be able to answer that question. But I'd like to go back to the last question. Let me assist the last, the la let me go back to the last question. I have narrow gauge railways in Albania, I have narrow gauge railways in Argentina, Australia, Australia, Austria, Bangladesh, Barbados, Belgium, Bosnia, Herzegovina, Brazil, Bulgaria, Canada, Chile, China, Democratic Republic of Congo, Croatia, Cyprus, Czech Republic, uh, Denmark, Estonia, Finland, France, Germany, Hong Kong, Hungary, India, Ireland, Isle of Man, Italy, Japan, Kazakhstan, uh, Latvia, Libya, Lithuania, Luxembourg. I have in Madagascar, Malawi, Malaysia, Mariana Island, Mexico, Mozambique, North Korea, Nepal, Netherlands, New Zealand, Macedonia, Norway, Pakistan, Poland, Portugal, Romania, Russia, Serbia, Slovakia, Slovenia, South Africa, Spain, Sri Lanka, Suriname, Sweden, Switzerland, Thailand, Tunisia, Turkey, uh, uh, Ukraine, United Kingdom, and United States of America. Have I answered the question? Those I critics will find that there. handy, but the Nigerian National Rail Plan says no to narrow gauge. And the Honorable Minister, before we you're begin also, to... You're also, you're also wrong. You're also wrong. You, you're <coughs> also wrong. You simply say that we should rehabilitate the narrow gauge. Well, Mr. Michi, before, 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 before we go, go, before we wrap up, uh, why does the Ministry of Transportation, has a, why does it have a cash-only payment uh, policy? The notice to passengers at uh, Ladini, cash only, in, at the various uh, train stations. Why is electronic uh, payment not allowed, not encouraged? Is this payment for tickets? Or? Tickets for tickets for train I tickets. Know, is this, I can't see you. Is it Ruben? It's Ruben. Ruben. Ruben now, about you're also wrong, Ruben. You're also wrong. Okay. Kaduna Abuja is electronic. You're wrong. Kaduna Abuja is electronic. Okay, but I'm quoting the, the Abelkuta Abel station. The Abelkuta station. The one in Ladiri in Abelkuta. Because we are yet to go because we are yet we are yet to go to cabinet to seek we have to advertise for people to bid for electronic ticketing. When we finish the process, we we'll go to cabinet. When we get cabinet approval, we commence that. It's not a thing you do immediately. I see. Well quickly before we go uh, Oh, I have a question. Oh, okay, please go ahead. Right. I have a question from a viewer. He's asking, can you ask Minister Mechi why the Calabas seaport is not functional and what are the plans to make it functional? Also, what is the status of Onicha and Lokoja inland river ports? I'm a politician, so I won't give you much answer in the, about Onicha and, and Lokoja. Uh, I, the, the answer I gave in, in uh, Barrow put me in trouble politically, so I, I won't give you the response to, <laughs> to Onisha and Lukoja. But Onisha, I think we are, they are in the process of, uh, uh, they are processing the, somebody warned that, but they, they, are, they are in the process of having to hand it over to him. 
local jail is under construction. That's the best I can tell you. What was the other question you asked? You, the, the gentleman Calabas asked, what happened to Calabas Seaport? Uh, Calabas Seaport? Calabas Seaport has to do with dredging, actually. But again, if, if, in, if enough uh, vessels were calling there, maybe we would have uh, been forced to do something quickly. But the, why it is not being dredged is that uh, if a, governor, a, a governor of one of the states in the country took, uh, took us to court. I think we, uh, when the, until the court case is over, then we can deal with the issue of dredging. All right. Well, Mr. Mich uh, Minister Michi, thank you very much for joining us on the morning show. Thank you very much indeed. We take a short break now, and when we.